Hello, my merry band of O-Satters, my intrepid bunch of knitters. Uh, welcome to this, the 25th, I believe, episode of the Sock Petition Podcast. It might be 26, I can't remember. Oh no, that's really bad. What a way to start. But still, you know me, this is no edited podcasting. Um, it's a 20 something episode and it's called Block Party. And uh, it's going to be, all will be revealed about why it's called Block Party later on in the episode. My name is Nathan Taylor. You can find me as Sockmetician on Ravelry, Instagram, Twitter, and right here on YouTube. So please do all the stuff you know how to do like, subscribe, share, get involved, join groups, get involved with all the chat. Please correspond with me. I love getting messages from everybody. And uh, I'd, I'd just sort of like to take a couple of moments, really, to, to say thank you. Um, this podcast has been going for over a year now, and I've really, really enjoyed doing it. I set it up, I've talked about this before, but I set it up because I wanted to engage with people in a way that I wouldn't necessarily be able to if I was just sitting at home knitting and and it's it's become really really gratifying i've made some really really good friends both in the virtual online space and people that i've met in real life as well and it's 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 just allowing me to let the knitting community be a real part of my life and for me to be part of it as well. Uh, so thank you for spending the time watching this podcast. I know there are many, many out there. So if you are spending an hour or so with me uh, every couple of weeks, then I value your time and I value your company. And thank you very much. If you are new to this podcast, well, I can't promise you it's going to change your life. <laughs> <laughs> I can't promise you it's going to thrill you or engage you in any way, but if it does, I'll be a very happy man. If it doesn't, please don't bother to let me know. I don't need to have any criticism. Life is difficult enough, isn't it, without people being unpleasant to one another? And heaven knows, as has been the subject of uh, a few people's podcasts recently, um, there's been enough division and hatred in the world at the moment, and and I think... I, I just sort of want to mention that and move past it. I've, I don't spend a great deal of time on Facebook, but I have never, never in my life known such a time of divisiveness, division, um, anger, bitterness, resentment. It's, it, my timeline is just full of people's... And this is, this is, for those of you outside the UK, I'm referring, of course, to uh, the... The result of the British referendum recently to to leave the, for Britain uh, to leave the EU. Uh, in my mistake, in my book, that's a big mistake, uh, and I think we're reaping the rewards of that with our economy taking a bit of a tumble. Um, but whether your views are the same as mine or not, um, we're kind of all in this together now. So I think we need to make the best of it. Now that's not something I would normally think of to say. I I, I staunchly stick by, by my own beliefs, um, and. I'm not going to go into all that here. This is a knitting podcast, but uh, so let's just move on and have a thoroughly lovely knitty time before we get onto the knitting stuff. And I've got plenty of stuff to show you this week. I uh, have had a very, very busy time. I don't know if any of you are aware, but immediately after I recorded the last episode of this podcast, catastrophe struck. Um, ben and I went away to his parents' house. Uh, in the evening and it, while we were gone there was a torrential rainstorm here in North London and we're not the only ones to be affected. I was watching uh, Kate Lavelli from Inside Number 23, I was watching her podcast last night from that same period and she was showing photographs of her street outside her house completely underwater, completely underwater. Um, well the same thing happened here Unfortunately, uh, we've got a problem with our ceiling just above me here. Um, and the roof has a bit of a, a drainage problem and when it reaches a certain level, it overflows and leaks into the house. And while we were gone, my ceiling flooded and we got back about one in the morning, not only to find our carpet completely soaked through, but also my computer had been underneath it and was in a puddle. In fact, was a puddle. There was a puddle of water on the keyboard, so it wasn't just a splash, it was completely drowned. And it had been on 
it had been on and it had been uploading the last episode of the podcast. So the last episode, I actually, thankfully, I'd kept all the raw footage on my phone, which is what I film on, uh, and I managed to get that off and re-edit the whole thing on Ben's computer so that I could at least not lose the episode. <sighs> but it had been about a month since I'd backed anything up, and I had in that month I'd had a sort of real frenzy of of knitting pattern admin and I had I'd done so much and I was just despairing because there was so much work that was going to be lost. So um, I put a claim in on the insurance, my household insurance, and actually things went rather well on that front. It was, uh, I mean the laptop probably cost about a thousand pounds, it's a, an Apple MacBook Pro and uh, I spend my life on it. Thankfully, I have an iPad and I was able to sort of transfer lots of my day-to-day -day -day admin onto that while I was without. But um, the guys from the insurance people, they, they came and took the laptop away because the first of all, they had to check to see whether or not it was going to be um, economical to repair. No, <laughs> it wasn't. And I knew this. Um, so when I got the phone call saying that they would need to replace it, normally they would replace me like for like. They'd send a new one back to me and I'd start again. Um, however, in this case, it turned out that the size of my hard drive was non-standard. I have a non-standard hard drive. Who knew? Uh, it was a rather large one. I had a rather large hard drive, which is non-standard. <laughs> this makes me very happy. And the reason it makes me happy is not because I'm a juvenile child. <laughs> <laughs> but because it meant that the size of my hard drive being 750 gigs, no longer standard on Apple MacBooks, um, which is now 500 or 512, depending on whether you have spinny disk or solid state. This was news to me. So I was thinking, well, this is no good. It means I'm going to uh, get a smaller computer and it's supposed to be like for like. He said, uh, so don't worry about that. He said, what we'll do is we will, we have to make a custom build for you. I said, well, that sounds great. Uh, how long is it going to take to get back to me? I'd already been without the laptop for about a week by this point and I was starting to get a little bit twitchy for it. And he said, well, normally it's uh, seven, five, to, five to seven working days, but because it's a, a custom build, it's going to be sort of up to ten working days. I said, mm, I'm really sorry. I said, I need to get back up and running sooner than that. Uh, I do everything in my life on my laptop and I need it back. Um, I said, is there a way that you can just send me the money? And he said, uh, yes. They can, and I had already been told that if I had, if I went for a cash option, I would get less money than it was actually worth because they are able to, because shenanigans within companies that do insurance, they're allowed to get hold of the stuff at a reduced rate. So all I would get would be the reduced price, and I just wanted to find out what that reduction would be and how much deficit there would be, so I could uh, dig into my pocket and get a new one just so I could do it quickly. And he said, well, interestingly, that is the correct information, but because it's a custom build is we, uh, we, would, we would, can't buy the parts at a reduced rate, we'd have to spend the money that it would actually cost. So because of that, you'll get the full figure back. So I got uh, more money than I paid for it, really. Uh, I think it was 1047 pounds and 60 pence, 1047 and 60 pence. So he, I said, well, does it, is it going to be uh, in the form of a voucher? Do I need to wait for that to come? He said, no, we'll do a bank transfer. You can go and buy one immediately. Yes. So I went off to uh, the local Apple store, which is uh, there's one about 20 minute drive away from here, and bought a new, I upgraded. So I got um, the top of the range. It's now uh, solid state, which is fast. It's got a faster processor. It's got a retina screen, which is brilliant. All of this geeky technical stuff, which I love. Um, and I was able to put in the backups from a month previous, so I could at least start from a month ago. There was quite a lot of stuff that I, was, I had lost. I had um, had my version of the SCARF pattern completely tech edited, and uh, that was uh, before the backup. No, sorry, after the backup, since the backup, so I didn't have that, so I knew I had a lot of work to do then. But there was still a chance that they might be able to retrieve some of the information from the old laptop. I didn't think it was going to happen. I genuinely didn't. And uh, I said to the guy, "What's you know, what does it depend on? And what in your when you get rain ingress, they called it, when you get rain ingress into a laptop, uh, what are the chances of being of the data being salvageable?" He said, "Well, it depends on what bits got wet. If the hard drive got wet, forget it." I was like, "Well, 
I'm going to forget it because the whole thing was underwater. It was a puddle. However, yesterday, through the post, arrived an external hard drive with my entire back, uh, MacBook hard drive on it, ready to plug in and put back on my new computer. I have never been more relieved. So the scarf is done, it's ready to go. At uh, long last, <laughs> it's been a long time coming, at long last it's ready to uh, release. I just need to spend some time, when I've got some time, to do it on Ravelry. So that's coming up very soon, which is amazing. Uh, I'm really, really excited about it. Really very, very excited to, to have that finally ready to go. Um, and all of the work I had done on the Il Barato scarf, which is the one uh, I showed last time in the four colours, I thought I'd lost a lot of work on that. I still had a PDF on my, on my iPad, but I didn't have any of the original stuff and I needed to get and do a lot of work, so I'd have to redo loads and loads of it. And it's a lot, because it's no repeats. Um, all of that, it's all there. All of my photographs, oh, everything. Oh, I was so pleased. And of course, I backed everything up. So there is a very happy ending to the story. I, yes, in fairness, I have spent maybe an extra three hundred pounds uh, upgrading everything, but in the end, at the end of the day, I've got everything back and I've got a much better computer as a result. Result. So there we are. Uh, that's that's that. Um, since I last saw you, I think I talked about it. Uh, I don't know, of course, I did because I, there was the appeal for uh, our little trip to France. Well, that was quite extraordinary. Uh, I'm not going to lie; it was thrilling and exasperating and scary. We went on Saturday the 25th, late at night. So we, we left London at um, about half past eight in the evening. I'd finished work, I'd had a 10 hour shift in the box office and then I went straight over to Pimlico so I could get on a bus um, to travel down to France through the night. Um, so we could be there for six o'clock in the morning where we were supposed to be meeting the BBC. To catch up people who don't remember the beginning of this story, uh, we went down with the cast of the NYMT, which is the National Youth Music Theatre, the cast of Brass, which is the show that Ben wrote in 2014 for them to perform in Leeds, which they did. They're remounting it in August next month now, <gasps> scary, uh, in London at the Hackney Empire on uh, Friday the 25th and Saturday the 26th of August. It's going to be amazing. It's a brilliant show and uh, it's music's fantastic, the cast are amazing, it's really really committed and fabulous. But we wanted to take them down to the, the Somme because the show is tells the tale of the first day of the Battle of the Somme where many of the, uh, the Leeds pals who went over and fought there uh, were wiped out. And we wanted to take them to the very spot a hundred years previously where these men had fought and died. We'd been there before, we knew exactly where to take them, and uh, we got on the bus, everything was fine, we got to Dover, everything was not fine. It was the day after um, the results to leave the EU had come out, the economy had gone down the toilet, uh, Europe was at this point saying, get out as quickly as you can, we're sick to, the, sick to the back teeth of you, and we want you gone now that you no longer want to be part of us, we want you out. And the French uh, Border Patrol decided they wanted to make things difficult for people and they were stopping 100% of vehicles for stop and search. Usually it's just a random thing every now and then, but they were stopping 100% of vehicles. And even though all of the information on the PNO website said, oh, arrive uh, 30 minutes before sailing, it was check in 30 minutes before sailing, there's no information at all about this extra, extra wait. And we were in a queue. We got there about an hour and a half before we were gonna sail, so we thought plenty of time. We were in that queue for two hours. Eventually, Ben uh, went off and spoke to the police and said, we have got a, a group of young people who are going, we have an appointment, at, uh, we have to be there by 7.30. We're supposed to be meeting the BBC at 6. We have to be there at 7.30. We are doing a commemoration ceremony to honour the men of Leeds who died 100 years ago. We have to be there for that time. We can't miss it. And eventually the, the, the English police overrode the French rules and they got us out of the queue. We were still 7th. There were still seven coaches in front of us. They uh, got us out and we drove on and our coach driver was like, it's, it's about time, we're, really, we're, we're about to go. Um, and we missed the ferry. The woman at the check-in gate was a bit officious and she wasn't interested in our story. And uh, we missed the ferry and the next one was two and a half hours later. Hmm, great, we thought. So it was, our ferry was supposed to leave at 10 to 1 in the morning. Um, 
Gallingly, we sat there at the gate watching the fact that the ferry sat there for an extra half hour after it was supposed to leave and we weren't allowed to get on it because the gates had been drawn up. So we didn't get a chance to get on it even though we could have done. Um, and the next one wasn't until 20 past 3, which of course is 20 past 4 French time, getting in at about 6 o'clock in the morning to Calais, and it's an hour and a half drive down to where we were supposed to be, and we were supposed to be meeting the BBC at 6. Not a chance. Um, the, our bus drivers were brilliant, and they said, we can do it. If we get in at 6 o'clock in Calais, we can get you there by 7.30. We will put our foot down. And in fairness to the guys at P&O, the people at the gate were really, really helpful, and they did say, we'll, we'll make sure we wave you onto the, because obviously this one, the lanes were filling up waiting to get on, and there's never any telling which, which way they're going to load you from, but they said, we'll get you on first, and we'll liaise with the guys on the boat to wave you to the position where you'll be right at the front, the pointy bit, um, so you'll be first off, because sometimes disembarking can take a long time. So uh, that, was, that was great. However, um, the ferry didn't leave until 40 minutes late. It was just, it was just a disaster. Um, apparently, they had decided to do a test with one of the lifeboats uh, after it had just arrived at port, and they couldn't get the lifeboat back on. They launched it and couldn't get it back on the boat, so they had to cut it adrift, which meant, of course, that we then had to set sail with one lifeboat too few, which meant that fewer people were allowed on because they didn't have the requisite number of lifeboats. It was a complete disaster. So we didn't actually leave Dover until four o'clock. This meant that we didn't get in to uh, Calais until oh, it was five o'clock in English time, so it was half past six. There was no chance we were going to get there in an hour, just no chance at all. Um, our, as I said, our bus drivers were brilliant and they did their best. Um, as, as soon as that gate went down, I told you we were first in the queue, as soon as that gate went down, usually a bus would pull away gently and go down the ramp. No, we were <laughs> flat back in our seats, he put his foot down and we were off. It was amazing. Um, thankfully there's never any uh, traffic on the roads in France, it's usually a very, very easy ride. And we did get there, obviously we certainly didn't get there till six, uh, at six o'clock when we were supposed to be meeting the BBC, we got there about eight o'clock. Um, so we'd missed, we'd missed the, the moment. The reason why it was supposed to be 7.30 was because that was the time the boys went over the top and we wanted to be there. We were five days prior to the 100th anniversary. We, wouldn't, we weren't going to be able to be there on the 100th anniversary because it was uh, all going to be cordoned off because they're expecting lots of people, quite obviously. Um, but we were able to, uh, to be there at around the same sort of it was important to us because we wanted to show them exactly where the sun was in the sky because it was a bright sunny day when they went over the top and, and we know from historical accounts that they were walking uphill into bright sunlight so they're being dazzled and we wanted our kids to experience that. Um, we were there half an hour later, it was not a problem. We then got into the graveyards and the cemeteries and we spent the whole day doing an amazing, amazing uh, tour of the place but in there are two particular cemeteries on the spot where the, the Lees Pals went over the top, so kind of just into no man's land where they're actually buried. And we, we met, I say we met, we, we took them and introduced them to the graves of, of two soldiers particularly who uh, characters from Ben's show are based on the lives of these two people. Uh, there's uh, Stanley Bicker's death has become Clyde Bickerdyke in the show and he's one of the sort of the officers and uh, a young lad called Horace Isles became uh, Morris in the show. And he, he was the youngest of the Leeds pals. He signed up when he was just 14. He lied about his age. And, uh, and he died when he was 16 years old. And what's really moving about his story is his sister, Florrie, in, in real life, his sister Florrie had written him a letter uh, pleading with him to, to tell his superiors that he was underage, so they'd have to send him back and her letter arrived just a little bit too late and he'd been killed in action and it was just, uh, her letter was just returned to her with a stamp on the envelope saying, killed in action, that's it. And so we had the girl who plays his sister in our show reading, standing at the grave of young Horace, uh, reading out the letter that Florrie had written a hundred years ago, almost to the day. 
it was incredibly moving. I'm filling up just thinking about it now. She could barely get through it, but she did an amazing job. She's done the show before, and she's in the new cast as well, so she's got a, a brilliant uh, resonance with the character. And I think for her to actually stand there reading the words written by the the girl who, who she's basing her portrayal on, it, it was really, really powerful for her. My dear Horace, just a line or two to thank you very much for the card which your mother gave me yesterday. It's very pretty. I'm so glad you've done all right so far, but I need not tell you what an anxious time I'm having on your account. You have dropped in for the thick of it, and no mistake. I only hope you have the good luck that they send you back safely, my dear boy. And I don't care how soon I should be more than pleased to see you, I can tell. You have no need to feel ashamed that you've signed up to the Leeds Pals now. For by all accounts, they have rendered a good account of themselves. No one can call them the Feather Fed Soldiers now. We, uh, we did hear that they were fetching all back from France under 19. For goodness sake, I was just tell them how old you are. I'm sure they'll send you back if they know that you're only 16. You have seen quite enough now, just chuck it up and try get back. You won't fare no worse for it. If you don't do it now, you'll come back in bits and we want the whole of you. I don't suppose you can do any letter writing now, but just remember that I'm always thinking of you and hoping for your safe return. So no more this time, only my love. Bob says you to hurry up and come back. Your loving sister, Flory. Flory wrote this letter nine days after her brother was killed. The letter was returned to her unopened with the words killed in action written across the front. Uh, we did a lot of readings at the gravesides and uh, we had four trumpeters from the, from the, the band who uh, played Ben's version of The Last Post, uh, which was really, really beautiful, really moving. Um, well, I filmed it. Why don't you take a look? <laughs> And then at the end of all of our readings, um, the whole cast got together and sang a sort of lullaby version of one of the songs in the show called uh, You'll Always Have a Friend. And the lyrics are very, very poignant. I read them out last time, but uh, here, here's the cast of the NYMT production of Brass 2016 singing You'll Always Have a Friend to the very men who gave their lives so many years ago. Just remember my face So I can visit you in your dreams Pack your bags for an adventure And we'll visit all the places that we've never seen So if we never make it home
From there we went on to uh, Beaumont Hamel, which is the Newfoundland memorial site, and it's got, we, went, we took them there not because they have any connection to the Canadians who lost their lives there, but because it's a, it's a protected piece of ground and it still shows the trench system and uh, the, the scars of the, of the bombs and the shells, it's all, all still there, and it, it, we wanted to give them a real sense of, of what, what the world was like at the time. And from there we went to Bousse les Artois, which was a little village where some of the Leeds pals were billeted. And uh, we, we took them into our favourite little museum, which is owned by a, a lovely man. He's a, a gardener for the Commonwealth War Graves Commission uh, called Gislain Lobel. And he, uh, he's collected stuff from the Leeds pals. He, he lived next door to a barn, which is where they actually slept. And a lot of them, of course, they never went back. So a lot of stuff was left behind. Um, and he's got quite a lot of it in his garden some beautiful things, really, really lovely things. And what was amazing is we were able to take the boys, the girls as well, but for the boys who, who were playing the characters, who some of the scenes take place in that very barn, we actually took them into it. And there's a hayloft, which was part of the original set, um, which the, the guys from the original production were like, oh, this, it looks just like, it just looks like what it does on stage. And I was like, yes, that's, that's because it's real. Uh, and I said to them all, I said, when you walk in here, I said, remember that first scene when the guys arrive in France, that first scene when they walk into the barn, this is what they're seeing. I said, so take mental pictures, remember how the light looks as it's coming through the holes in the tiles, how the straw is on the halos and how the rafters build this, this sort of internal structure, which, which was their, it was their, their starry night for, for however many years they were there. I uh, said, so this is what they were seeing, and I want you to remember this when you walk on stage and see it again. Uh, oh, it's just, it's the best thing. Give, giving giving theatre a, a grounding in a real reality is, I suppose, a fake reality, uh, is, uh, is the best way to make it come alive for the audience as well. So not only are the actors going to get so much from having done that, but I think the audience will get a better understanding of what they're going through, what the characters are feeling, because the actors know it. They've been there, they've stood in it. Amazing. Um, anyway, that was a very, very long day. By the time I got home, I'd been awake for 39 hours without a single uh, blink of sleep, and I slept for 11 hours straight. <laughs> oh, so that was that. Um, then my birthday happened. Uh, my birthday happened on the 30th of June, six days ago. I'm now the grand old age of 42, and uh, the silver in my beard is... Uh, is showing that. What do you think of the beard now, guys and girls? It's getting rather large and luxurious. Uh, it's just been freshly oiled and combed, so it's looking quite healthy at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of it. There's a good sort of two inches under my chin. Quite enjoying it. Uh, I'm deliberately not not uh, trimming it or trying to shape it in any way. I'm just letting it go to see what's going to happen. <laughs> it's getting mixed reviews. Um, I was I was at a family do, which I'll tell you about in a minute, and my auntie Diane said, get that toilet brush off your face. I don't think she likes it very much. Now here's the thing. Here's an interesting thing. It seems to be okay, and it's always women. This is a generalisation, this is a gender stereotype, but it's, in my observation it's true. It seems to be okay for women to say uncomplimentary things to men. Clearly, I have chosen to, to grow a beard. Clearly, that's a statement. Uh, and when people make a statement about how they look, it's, it can often be quite a vulnerable position to be in. Now, imagine if a man were to say to a woman who had just come back from the hairdressers and cut a new style and said, Oh, God, I don't like that. It looked much better before. That would be unacceptable, right? The same doesn't seem to be true for men. It seems to be okay to say, oh, I don't like the beard. Oh, I much prefer you all clean shaven. Oh, uh, 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 oh, why have you cut your hair? Why, why have you shaved your head? All these things. Um, without, I'm sure there's no malice intended in it, but actually, when people do make those choices, it's because they like it. You know, I've, I've decided I like wearing a beard. I like having a beard and being a bearded man. And, and to be told that that's unattractive, you know, I deal with it because I'm 42 and I've lived long enough to, to brush those things aside. But actually, if you think about where it comes from, not acceptable, just not. So uh, and I think this is all part and parcel to, there's something about, it's kind of like, it's, it's in a way trying to emasculate men some way. 
my mum and my sister used to do this to me when I was growing up as well. Um, when I started, when my, my top lip first started to get a little bit dark, of dark hair on it, they'd be teasing. There'd be all sorts of, oh, look, you can start shaving soon, of course, and it just gets darker and darker, and you don't want to end up with a moustache. And then the first time you shave, it, it's, it's a big step for a young man. And, uh, and then you get teased for having done that, so, oh, no, there's no shame. And actually, it's cripplingly embarrassing. So I say this because I know there's a lot of female watchers of this podcast. If you have young men in your life, don't embarrass them like that. Don't, uh, uh, don't shame them about things they can do nothing about. You can't do anything about your facial hair starting to grow when you're going through puberty. Uh, it's not nice to have it ridiculed. I didn't mean to go into that, but uh, I just felt... <laughs> I obviously feel quite strongly about that. It's obviously bruised and scarred me. Um, anyway, uh, so I'm 42 and uh, I had a birthday with some lots of lovely stash enhancements. I'll tell you about those when we get into that section and I can't wait. I may have bought some stuff as well. I may have gone a little bit mad recently, so there's plenty of stuff to share. Um, and then I've had a busy weekend, really, really busy weekend. The roundup is going on forever, but I'll, I'll try and wrap it up as quickly as I can. Um, on Saturday, I was incredibly pleased to be able to teach a double knitting workshop at Loop. Loop is one of London's uh, premier yarn shops. In fact, probably one of the UK's premier yarn shops and it's known worldwide. And uh, getting the opportunity to teach there was really, really quite exciting. Uh, the class was sold out, I had seven students. We deliberately kept it small because I think it's, it's much more manageable like that. And we had, uh, we had a really, really good day. A really good day. It was a little bit longer than any class I've done before, which I really liked. It was a five-hour workshop. We had a break for lunch in the middle, but five hours on it. Um, and often, when I've been teaching double knitting before, it's felt a little bit rushed. And I think people panic when there's... Because there's a lot to learn. You need to learn how to cast on for double knitting, how to work two yarns together and do the mechanics of double knitting, how to make the edges work, and then how to cast, or how to change colour, and how to cast off. And of course, all of that has to happen right at the beginning. Casting on, knitting, and doing an edge, all comes hot on the heels of itself. So people can start to panic a bit if, if there's limited time. So I actually think having the longer session that we did gave us plenty of breathing space, so much so that people relaxed and actually worked more quickly, <laughs> oddly. Um, and then, yeah, oh, it was just brilliant. We had, we had such a laugh. So we were making these little heart coasters, which uh, I always start off with. They're like 15 pairs of stitches wide, 22 rows deep, and a little heart motif in the middle. And they're charming. They're, they're, you know, you could, they're practical. You can actually use them as a coaster if you want to. Um, give them away, hang them on a Christmas tree, lovely. Um, but they, they, they were like a miniature version of a finished product, project that has quite a lot of the skills needed. So you could go and you could knit a double knitted scarf after doing one of these. The team did so well, we even talked about fixing errors. Errors happen, so we thought, oh, I've, I've messed up. So I said, okay, well, let's fix it. What do you mean, let's fix it? Okay, let's go back to that, let's drop these stitches down, let's swap them over and knit them back up. And they're like, oh. We call it open heart surgery. <laughs> we were literally on in the hearts and we were going down and fixing uh, errors and we talked about all kinds of we even got as far as learning how to do reverse stocking stitch in uh, double knitting which is a completely different method it's not just knit, pearling where you knit and knitting where you purl there is that but it's more to it um, so they've got a, a, an idea of how they can work different textures into their DK and uh, and that's a platform to other things like cables or uh, um, lace work, all of which are possible in DK. They did brilliantly. Here's a little selection of some photographs of their finished objects. I could not have been prouder of all of my team. Um, and at the end of the day, there are seven new double knitters out in the world, confident enough to go out and, and start their own projects. And I know at least two of them have already purchased some of my patterns, so I know that they were interested and inspired enough to want to go on and do more. Great stuff, ladies, really great. I didn't have any male students, uh, which was absolutely fine. I'd have liked to have had some male students as well, but uh, we had a great time, didn't we, gals? Marvellous. Then, on Sunday, I took part in the first uh, public, co public concert of a new vocal harmony group that I've become involved with. 
My friend Carrie Rawlings, who sang in the choir for my wedding, uh, is a good friend of mine, and she has put together uh, with a management team uh, this corporate, it's for the corporate market essentially, um, going, going and doing some glee or perfect pitch style vocal harmony stuff um, for concerts, for gigs, for conferences, for all, any, any kind of event, dinners, anything you can think of. Um, and although there's 24 of us, the likelihood is we'll probably be most of us, most of the time, about doing it like eight piece. And this is what we were in Cambridge. Uh, Carrie is a choir leader herself, of, she's part of the Rock Choir franchise, um, and it was their summer party and she got us on board to be kind of like the special guests. They, did, they were brilliant, they were absolutely amazing. There was 150 of them on stage, they make a big, big noise. Mostly women, there were some men lurking there in the background, um, but a, a predominantly female sound. Uh, some lovely soloists, it was just, it was great. And we did our, we've only got five songs in our repertoire at the moment, so we need to work on that. Um, but we did all five of them. We sing Hold Back the River. Uh, Hold Back the River, what you look I don't know, the, I just sing a harmony, I don't know what the lyrics are. Um, and we sing Don't Stop Believing as an a cappella, uh, like the glee version with the da ba 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 you know the one. Um, and uh, what else did we do? Oh, a lovely a cappella version of God Only Knows, really gentle, really sort of mm, 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 some very chewy harmonies in that, arranged by the fabulous Jenny Deacon, who's one of our member members. And uh, we do, oh, the, from Perfect Pitch, if anyone's seen the film Perfect Pitch, we do the Bella's final selection. So it starts off with uh, uh, Jesse J, money, you know, cha-ching, cha-ching, uh, goes into Don't You Forget About Me, Human League, is it? Uh, and into uh, Tonight, I Will Love, Love You Tonight. That's a brilliant medley and all put together. Really, really nice. Uh, lots of fun to sing. Oh, and the other one is John Legend's All of Me. Really nice scrunchy harmonies on that one. Rah, lovely. Uh, so, and it went down a storm, and it was great fun. Uh, do you know, I love nothing more than sitting with, or standing with a group of people just making nice music. And the human voice is capable of brilliance. We, just when we were rehearsing, just sitting in the dressing room, we thought we'd, we'd pitch our notes. With no piano, we'd just sing. It's like we were making beautiful music. What's not to love about that? And it went down really well. The audience loved it. I think the choir... I think they were a little bit nervous of us being there because we we're all professional singers um, and the, the whole point of rock choir is it's not professional singers, it's people who want to get together and, and have some fun singing, as, as they should. Um, and for no reason at all, I think they were a little bit intimidated by us, um, but they, were, they had no reason to be, they were doing a brilliant job. And I think they actually sort of were able to kind of lift their game a little bit because they, they sort of wanted to impress us in a weird kind of way. It was nice. It was really, really lovely. And we've got another one of those coming up next Sunday, uh, which will be great fun. And I'm nearly up to date. Um, and then Monday was my uncle's funeral. Uh, my uncle Graham, who passed away about three weeks ago, uh, it was his funeral. So I went down to Exeter with um, various members of my family. My dad's side of the family is my dad's brother. And my dad's younger brother, which is very, very sad. Uh, he was my godfather as well. Um, I. I can't say that I'm really grieving. I didn't know him that well. I have only seen him once in the last few years, and it was about a year ago. Um, and he hadn't been well. So uh, it was, he died unexpectedly, but it wasn't that unexpected, if you see what I mean. Um, but it was really, really lovely to see my Auntie Lorna and my Auntie Diane, who are 73 three and nearly 81. My dad's two older sisters. Um, they're both brilliant. They're proper forces to be reckoned with. Um, you don't mess with them at all, but they're, they're brilliant, brilliant people. And I've met a lot of cousins, people I haven't seen. I don't know all of my cousins, there's millions of us. Um, and it was nice to see people I haven't seen for a long, long time. And people I've never met. Uh, so all in all, it was a, a positive experience. I, do you know, I, if I may if, indulge me in being a little bit melancholy for a bit, if you don't mind. I did feel a little bit sad because the, the service was very, very brief. It was a cremation service, very, very short. No readings, no singing, no poems, just a few sentences about his life. And then the curtains closed and we left. Um, we left to the music of Always Look on the Bright Side of Life, which I thought was a really, really nice choice. 
Um, but apart from that, I just got the impression that he he didn't leave much of a dent in the world. I can't put it any other way. And I, I was trying to analyse that, and I wondered if whether, as a performer, as a creative, as a designer, I'm, I'm constantly trying to do something with this constant urge to, to leave some kind of legacy, something behind me when I, when I go. And I sort of got the impression that Uncle Graham hadn't really done that. And then I thought, well, maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's most people's experience of life. Maybe people don't worry about that. They live, they love, they leave. Gosh, that, <laughs> that was quite succinct. You live, you love, you leave. And, and maybe, that's, maybe that's it. Um, so maybe it's, maybe it's in me that I felt the sadness because I'm, maybe that's some, the thing I fear most. I don't know. How do you feel about it? I'm not talking in sort of in a spiritual or in a, in a, in a morbid way, but um, I'd be interested to know your thoughts on, on what you feel about your wish to leave something behind you or not. Whether you, you don't mind at all, it's sort of about what you do in this life or whether, what, what are your thoughts? Um, just get in the general chatter thread and we'll, we'll start a conversation about that because I'd be interested to know if it's just me that feels like this or whether it's the part of the human condition. I am going to crack straight on. I've been chatting and burbling away already. So today, there's not going to be a grammar rant. Um, there's not going to be much of a community section, but I'll touch on that in a bit for a minute. And I'm not doing what's that either. I was going to, but I'm really not. And the reason I want to move straight on is because there's a lot to talk about. And I'm really excited. So I'm going to pick up the mood now because I've got a little bit low talking about all the sad things. Death in France, death in Exeter, all that kind of stuff. Gone. Move on. Uh, the Stucal has come to an end. The Stucal, of course, is the sock magician's toe-ups knit along. And I, I'm so, so excited. There were 66 finished objects in the Stucal FO thread. That's brilliant. That is, uh, without doubt, the, the best subscribed thing that I've ever done on my Ravelry group. I'm just not long after lunch, and uh, and it, it. I just want to sort of thank everybody for taking part. Sixty six is brilliant, and I know lots more people out there are making their STUs as well, um, and hopefully having great success. Many people have entered multiple, sort of some people up to four. I think was the the highest number uh, of of entries by the same person. I think there were several people who'd got to four pairs of socks all entered separately and all therefore valid for uh, a win. Now, uh, where is it? So uh, this is thanks to uh, Alison Keyes, uh, who is the kind donor of two of our prizes. So here they are, just so that you can see them again. We've got this, which is the Natural Dye Studio. Uh, this is pink, but it, can you see? Yeah, it's got some Stellina in it, so it's sparkly pink and sparkly, and that is Stardust DK, 75% Merino, 20% Silk, woohoo, and 5% Stellina, and that's, uh, DK weights are 212 metres per 100 grams. That's really, really nice there, um, and I think that will make somebody very, very happy indeed. Uh, and the other prize that's come from Alison is Blueface Leicester. This is uh, it's a fingering weight, so it's 400 metres for 100 grams, and it's called Dazzle. This is natural dye studio as well. And um, Spice is the name of the the, the, uh, the colorway. And that's really, really lovely. Sort of like a semi-solid, well, heathered, really, uh, orange color. It's kind of, on screen it's looking very, very orange, but in life it's kind of a bit tipping slightly in towards coral. Interesting, very interesting color. I, when I say that, that sounds like it's a horrible thing. Coral is a nice thing, right? Yeah. Um, so these are, are two of the prizes, and the other prizes, there are going to be five prizes in total, um, are going to be... Uh, I've lost word, patterns, thank you, knitting podcast, patterns. Uh, five, uh, three other prizes are going to be patterns from my Ravelry store, so uh, the lucky recipients are going to be able to, to choose any one of my patterns from my store. Don't choose the STUs, you've already got it. Okay? 
Okay. Uh, so, I've been looking through and uh, I have, hang on, where is it? I've got my winners on my page here. So the first winner is also actually the first person to have posted in the thread and it's Margaret from Adelaide in Australia. Congratulations Margaret, she's bar bear. She has I think three, if you look at posts one, post 18 and post 41, um, but let's have a little look at some of her work here. Um, uh, 18. Yeah, so these are the ones I showed these the other, the other week. I absolutely love these socks. These are brilliant. They are, they're so completely fantastically asymmetr asymmetrical. And I know it looks at first glance like uh, you've just sort of swapped the colours around and kept the toes and cuffs the so. same. It's so, it's so not. They're completely off centred and, and just, this is just random colour changes in there. I love it. I absolutely love it. Uh, so well done, Margaret. Um, it's got a naughty title, that uh, colourway. I'm not going to say it on my podcast. It's called Shift Your Ass. Um, uh, one of the colours there that she's used. So that's brilliant. So well done, Margaret. Uh, you are the proud owner of the pink. There it is, just for you, coming at you, coming to Australia anytime soon. The second winner is going to be the recipient of this gorgeous skein of the, of the um, fingering weight yarn. And this is Janet from Liverpool, whose name on Ravelry is Yellow Pink Sparkly. Uh, and she's one of the four sock uh, sets. And let me see if I can find some of Janet's to show you. I think she just got one in under the radar at the end of the... I, le I deliberately left the, the thread open a little while longer. I wanted people to get the chance to get everything in there. Um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, here's one of them. This is one where she's, again, used uh, contrasting uh, heels, toes and cuffs. And... Nice and short socks there, which may explain why she was able to get through four pairs in the time that the, the cow was running. But well done, Janet. Um, did I say where you're from? Uh, from Liverpool, yes, up in the north of England. In fact, my husband is going to Liverpool on Monday. Uh, so you're the recipient of this. So thank you to Alison. Genuinely, thank you, Alison. Um, you'll see I've got all my birthday cards here. There's actually one from Alison, which is just tucked in there. And no, Alison, I haven't yet been able to decipher all of the dingbats on it, um, but I will give it some more thought and I will get back to you and let you know if I get them sorted. I'm playing with my thumb at the moment. Can you see? Look, a blister right there. It's really, really quite painful. Ben and I went out to our little cafe. On the, our, you at, at, exit our building from around the side here. You have to walk around three sides of the building to get to the main road here. And down the road, there's a little cafe and we often go there for lunch when, we, when we're feeling too lazy to make our own food, which we did today. On the way back, we uh, passed a cleaning supplies shop. I said, should we buy a broom? <laughs> there's a very long path that leads from the entrance to our garden up to the road. And it's a mess. And nobody seems to look after it. Um, it's not, it's not a road, it's literally just an alleyway. Wall on one side, fences on the other with the gates into our gardens. Um, it doesn't seem to be owned by anybody. No one looks after it, no one takes care of it at all. And it's just got big overgrown with mud, with weeds, with rubbish, broken crockery. And it's like, oh my God, this is like living somewhere third world. Uh, so I decided that we would buy this broom. Ben and I spent an hour just before I started podcasting this, me sweeping and him shoveling to get everything in bags. And it's, it's clear and it's looking fabulous. But I put my thumb. Thankfully, I don't think yeah, you can see that. I don't think it's an area that's going to affect any any knitting. I haven't held any needles since I've come back in. Let's hope not, because I've got a lot of knitting I want to get on with. Um, so moving on, back into the other three recipients. So, uh, guys, the next three names that I'm going to announce, um, you can choose any pattern in my uh, Ravelry store, and I will send that to you with my compliments. Uh, so, the first of these is uh, Blecky, who is Miriam from Indiana. Congratulations, Miriam, uh, for post 14. Let me find post 14 so I can show you her socks. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. 
14, I've, I've, I can't find it at all, 15, 14, here we are, the Blackie. Um, so, um, do you know, I chose these, because I just really like them, for no other reason, I really like these socks, I think they're lovely, they're nice and long, and uh, you've chosen contrasting heel, toes and cuffs, but you've matched so, so well, that really, that purple looks like it belongs with that self-striving, it really, really does, and they're, do you know, I just think they're fabulous socks and they look like they're a really, really perfect, comfy fit as well. So well done to you. Um, so Miriam, you can choose any pattern you like and I'll send it over to you. The next one, now I don't know whose name this is, uh, I can only give you the Ravner names. No information on your post at all on your, uh, um, what's it called? What's it called? That page where you've got all your details on it. Profile! <laughs> <laughs> 42 you see it's all gone it's the brain dribbling out of ears um, on your profile page there's no information of where you are or what your name is but you are this crafty bird on Ravelry and your socks are post 25 now there's a very good reason why I've chosen these Kay Jones if you're watching this look away now you may not like these socks I love them this this is when pooling can really, really go right. I know sometimes people think that it's a bit ugly, and I know Kay's not a fan at all, but I think this is such dramatic pooling. I think these socks look amazing. Look at that, look at those zigzags going on. It's almost at the top of this, this sock here. It's almost like uh, the, the lady's gauge is completely in line with with like one repeat of the yarn round one round of the sock. I love it, I love these zigzags. I think it's really striking, really dramatic. And that is why this crafty bird, I'm assuming lady, bird I'm taking as a, a feminine uh, denoter, um, that's why you're getting that. So again, you can choose any one of my, I'll send you a little note on Ravelry, um, but you can choose any one of the patterns in my Ravelry store and that will be coming to you. And finally, from this crafty bird to the crafty tyke, who is Sheila from Rotherham, again in North London. Uh, I think you've got three pairs of, of STUs, 20, posts 26, 27, and 69. So let me see if I can, 26, 27, and 69. La la la, here we go. Um, so here's two of them. So we've got this lovely pair of uh, self stripers there and these amazing gorgeous rainbows i really love how the colors transition there they don't they don't go from one color exactly to the next what they do is they kind of they don't it's not a smooth gradient they've got this weird feathering love it love that yarn um so uh, sheila congratulations well done to you and well done to everybody else thank you so much for taking part it really means a lot to me that you bothered um and i know that uh you'll enjoy this and your patterns and I hope you'll make fabulous things with them, be it my patterns or, or not. <laughs> uh, so there we are, that is, um, the, the stew cow is over. The, the thread, the stew, the stew thread, uh, the stew chatter thread. It looks like I've lost the ability to speak. I don't know why. I don't know what this is all about. I think maybe I'm a bit tired. Maybe I've just been talking too long. Anyway, uh, the chatter thread will remain open for people who want to talk about the pattern and air any uh, views, comments, suggestions, whatever. Uh, but that's it. The STU cow is over. I've thoroughly enjoyed keeping tabs on it with everybody and I cannot wait to carry on to something else. Oh, there's, there's a little beetle. Sorry about this. I'm going to exit. Can a little beetle crawling on something. I don't like it. Um, I don't know what it is. Horrible. Anyway, that's what you get for uh, summer, summer podcasting, I guess. Things are going to crawl on your knitting. So, let's go into uh, stash enhancement, shall we? I'm really excited. I've got so much to show you. <laughs> One of the first things I want to show you was uh, a lovely, lovely, lovely gift from one of my students from the DK class at Loop last weekend. Uh, Mel, 
who is Dubai Mel here on Ravelry. Uh, Mel and I already knew each other. We met at uh, Inet Fandango probably over a year ago and we stayed in touch off and on. Um, but she, she lives in Dubai, but she stays for the summer um, in London. And so she thought she'd come along to the, the class. And I think, Mel, I think you rather enjoyed it. You certainly did very well. Um, but she had brought with her the, the most charming, sweetest gift. And just as we were all saying goodbye, she said, I've got something for you. And it's a project bag that she has made just for me. Um, and it's, it's absolutely lovely. And here it is. It's sort of got stardust and music notes and stuff all over it. And actually, often people, when they do sort of music design, when they're doing these kind of things, the notes don't necessarily make any sense. Well, this all actually looks like real music to me. I don't think it's real tunes, but it's at least music that could actually exist, rather than notes backwards or upside down, or dreadful things that some people who try and think, oh, well, let's put some music notes on something. Um, whoever designed this material has done a good job. <laughs> um, it's got a nice little ook there so I can put a hand strap on it and I do have a strap that I can use on that because I do like to be able to carry around. It's drawstring which is very nice so there's going to be no snagging on zips or anything like that with a nice sturdy ribbon that matches very well. It's an incredibly sturdy bag I have to say. It's, um, it's clearly been interfaced uh, to within an inch of its life. It's a really nice size, it's probably a little bit better, bigger than just a single sock. Uh, it's got a nice sort of square base. It's just really beautifully done. Um, if you look at the top here, you can see this little line of grey top stitching. It's so close. I mean, it's impossible to sell because it's on black material. Um, if you can, you see the edge of the material there. It's not going to focus. It's, uh, maybe you see the edge of the material. The top stitching is so close to the edge of that, and so even and so neat. I don't know how anyone manages. I've just been watching the. Uh, the, the sewing bee, for anyone who's outside the UK, the BBC has this series called The Great British Sewing Bee, and it's basically like X Factor for sewers. Um, people get voted off, not voted off, but they booted off at one a week, and eventually you get left with a winner. And I just, I'm in awe, really. I, I don't have a particular interest in sewing. I, I can sew on a button, and I've sewn up seams of ripped trousers and that kind of stuff. I can do practical kind of things, but I can't make anything. I wouldn't know where to begin, and I've never, never used a sewing machine. Um, and I just think, uh, look, look at how all these, all these seams line up so beautifully. You probably can't see that, it's all too dark. But it's exquisite work. Mel, thank you so, so much. Um, and inside, it's got this lovely grey fabric, and you can just see there, these are, it's got a double pocket, so you can put things and keep things separate in your two pockets there. It's really lovely. I was very touched. Thank you very much. You didn't need to do that at all. I'm very happy that you did. Thank you. So that was uh, that. On my birthday, I got uh, two lovely, lovely skeins of yarn from my husband. Ooh, where's... Where are they? <laughs> they're, they're lurking down. Oh, here they are in this bag. He obviously... He went to Loop. He w I had given him instructions. There was something specific I wanted him to buy. And he goes into Loop every year and he says, Hi, I'm Nathan's husband. And they'll go, oh, hello, because I've been going to Loop for so long they know who I am. Um, and I want to get him some yarn. What do you think he'd like? And they know me very well. <laughs> um, so he's got two lovely, lovely skeins of uh, sock yarn. The first of which is Tosh Sock which I haven't actually knitted in for a while. Look at that, it's looking like a proper electric blue on screen. It's not quite that bright, but it is very, very vivid. Um, Tosh Sock is lovely. This is a colorway lapis. Um, if you've never worked with Tosh Sock before, it is 100% uh, superwash merino wool. So there's no nylon content in it, but it wears quite well for a, a non-nylon sock. It's quite thick. It's only 361 meters per 100 grams, so it's quite a, a juicy, oh, lovely, meaty yarn, which I really, really enjoy working with. It's got a nice high twist on it, can you see? So it hardly fuzzes or blooms at all, which makes it really, really good for double knitting, but also nice for socks as well. Um, and I think this will just become a pair of really, really nice socks. I may put some little accents of some other colour in there. It's almost solid, it's not quite, you can see some slightly paler streaks running through it, but it's really, 
a very, very lovely, lovely, bright, vivid colour. I'm just going to get some water. Because I've been talking too much. Too long. Too long, baby. Too long. Mmm. Apologies. When you have a moustache quite as bushy as this, when you drink, it goes and it takes up enormous amounts of water. So what I have to do, things you don't know if you're a lady who's never had a moustache, things you don't know if you're a man who's never had a moustache, you have to do this at the end of it. I have to suck the water out of my moustache. <laughs> There you go. It's all been beautifully oils and conditions, very nice and clean. So this is the Lapis, uh, obviously, no, not Lapis, Lazuli, uh, Lapis Madeline Tosh. Nice. The other one, I have to say, much as I love the Madeline Tosh, I'm a little bit in love with this. This is Socks That Rock. It's 100% Superwash Merino again. This is their lightweight, hand-dyed fibre. Approximately 370 metres, so it's again quite a heavy one, um, not quite so long. The colourway is called Fire on the Mountain, and it looks like this. Oh, what are you trying to do to me? I cannot tell you how much I love this. I just want to knit with it straight away. I've got quite a lot of things on the needles at the moment, but I just, oh, I just want it to, I want it to be socks. I don't want it to be any more than that. I love knitting socks. I love owning socks. <sighs> just gorgeous. Look at it. Look at how juicy those colors are and how they beautifully blend from, excuse me, from one to the other. Bit of fluff on there, get rid of that. From one to the other. And this sort of like odd sort of muddy green into the purple and then an explosion of oranges and reds and greens and pinks and purples and lilacs and oh it's gorgeous it's really soft as well I would have said if I didn't know I would have said there was some other kind of softer fiber than just um, SW Merino but it's it's beautiful I've not worked with this before I've never owned any Blue Moon before this is socks that rock I can't tell you how much I love it look at that I mean if I were to come across my own podcast from the perspective of being someone else, I could just happily sit and watch an hour of this being rotated, no one saying anything, just watching those colours merge from one to the other. It's absolutely beautiful. I cannot wait to get it on the needles. I genuinely cannot wait. It'll be in here, Mel. This is the one I was telling you about when I said I knew exactly the yarn I wanted to make with your, and um, where, use your bag for. <laughs> oh, I haven't undone it enough. Look at that. <laughs> lovely, very exciting. Um, so that was that. I also got a lovely uh, check through the post from Ben's parents who decided they didn't want to buy me any yarn, but the money was specifically for yarn and had to be spent on yarn. So I went to Loop yesterday. Um, I'd seen this on Saturday when I was in there and I didn't buy it and I was hoping it would still be there. It's two skeins. I have a very specific project in mind for it which I cannot tell you about at the moment. Um, it's Casbar Sock from Handmaiden Yarns and which is one of my favourite bases of all time. It's 81% Merino, 9% Cashmere and 10% Nylon and it's machine washable It's the softest, squishiest, bounciest sock base you'll ever, ever work with. Probably my favourite base, ever. And this colourway, I bought two skeins. It's called Pewter. Oh, for completely different reasons than the rainbow one. I love this. It's... Oh. Do you know what it reminds me of? Years ago, when I was at school, we'd go out brass rubbing, you know, in, in churches, and there were crayons, specific crayons for rubbing brasses with, which were silver, gold, and bronze. And they looked like this. Isn't it just, it just looks like beautiful, rusted ironwork. It's got the sheen to it, which, 
it has to be the cashmere, I guess, but, but it's almost like a silky sheen. It's just, oh, I can't, I just can't tell you how much this makes me feel happy. I could just sit like this all day. Oh, it's weird like this, I can't hear myself. I'm blocking out my own voice, I sound very strange. <laughs> you don't need to know that. Look, look at that. So I reckon when that's knitted up, it's going to look like burnished bronze. Mm. Oh, it's so soft, it's so beautiful. Oh, it's just gorgeous. If you've never knit with it before, uh, it's 115 grams of skeins. It's a little bit thicker than most and you get uh, 325 meters. So it's, it's officially a sport weight. I've always knitted socks with it before um, and I happily get a pair of socks out of it. Um, not the longest socks in the world, but um, certainly not, not on my size nine man feet. Um, it's, it's, just, it's beautiful. <laughs> just beautiful. There's not many places in the UK that sell this, Luke being one of them, which is why I had to get this. So this is my birthday present from Richard and Noel, my uh, in-laws. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other part of my stash enhancement I'm actually not going to talk about just yet I'm going to talk about that when I get into whips okay because um, yeah because it's, part, it's attached already I bought it yesterday and it's already attached some of it is already attached to a whip so I'll show you that all in one go um, but Moving on from uh, stash enhancement for yarn and bags, the thing that I sent Ben into uh, Loop to get is a book. Now this is very, this is quite interesting for me. I don't tend to buy pattern books, um, but this one has really caught my eye, and for for several reasons, which I'll go about more into later. Um, I'll go into more into about more later. Oh, there's too many prepositions in that sentence. I don't know which way around they should all be. Um, I'll talk about that more in detail later on. Um, and it's, anyway, it's, the, it's this. It's making a lot of waves at the moment. It's Kate Davis's collection of, um, edited by Kate Davis and Jen Arnold Culliford. It's the Book of Haps. Now, I didn't know what a hap was. Uh, I thought it was just a shawl, isn't it? There's a great deal of information at the beginning about the difference between haps and shawls and the etymology of the two words and it's, it's really really interesting I'm not going to go into it all here but uh, there's some lovely really lovely designs in this some of which I'm more than a little bit taken with now I say it's unusual for me because I don't being a designer and always knitting my own stuff I don't really have a great deal of time for knitting other people's things particularly the like big time commitments like a huge hap Basically, that in Scotland, and actually throughout England in the sort of Middle Ages, the, the verb to hap meant to sort of cover, enfold, protect, warm. Um, so, you, uh, and apparently in places in Shetland today, children might still be told to hap up against the cold, um, to like wrap themselves up. And uh, so a piece of cloth that would do that, that would enfold you and wrap you up, would be a hap. Um, and the, the main difference was that shawls, the word shawl came from Kashmir and uh, those beautiful ornate shawls and shawls were seen as things of decoration whereas a hat was very functional. Um, some photographs of some Shetland hats in here. Uh, women wearing this lady knitting, uh, knitting <laughs> she's knitting a cow, milking a cow wearing her hat. So it was very practical, functional, everyday items. Um, and that appeals to me, it really, really does appeal to me. I love sort of big pieces of knitted fabric. I'm, I'm quite tempted to knit one of Stephen West's um, brioche, brioche Evron uh, blankets because they're just, it's just a lot of knitted fabric. Um, and here's a coloured one being all blocked out on a blocking frame from goodness only knows how long, maybe the 70s I think that was from. So, but there's some beautiful stuff in here, really, really nice designs and uh, one in particular really caught my eye and it is already a whip. So this allied with the uh, yarn is all going to come into whips later on. But some of the other patterns I'm tempted to make, you know, something like this, absolutely gorgeous. It's a lot of garter stitch. 
it's beautiful, don't get me wrong, it's very, very lovely. Um, I just think, I'm not sure I could, I'm not sure I could do that. <laughs> I'm just not sure I could. Um, but I really love, I really love the idea they're just, they're, they're huge, these things are enormous. Look at this blocking there, it's like absolutely colossal. That appeals to me. My Genesis shawl is huge and I love it for that very reason. Um, and oh, this one's very nice as well. The Harewood Hat by Bristol Ivy. Look at that. Really nice. I'm not going to show you the one that I'm making at the moment, but I'll talk to you about it. So this was a book I'm really looking forward to digging into. It. There's a lot of essay material at the beginning and the history of the etymology and the history of, uh, of hats through the ages and what they're like today. And the idea of this book is it's a sort of a modern day take on a traditional hat. So a lot of these you may well they're just shawls, they're just what well, but then where do you draw the line between hat and shawl? To call it a hat shawl, as discussed in the book, it's a bit of a tauto tautology. So it's a hat. Moving on then into uh, finished objects. I've got some finished objects. They're all things you've seen before, clearly, um, in their FO state. Finally, since the last one, I finished these, my Misty Alpaca socks, which I absolutely love. Um, they're really, really long. I haven't actually worn them before, so I'm gonna stick them on now. Um, they're really, really long. They're incredibly cozy. Uh, the, the Misty Alpaca base is really nice. Um, so they are, they go quite some way up my leg, but they're just gorgeous. This, the colours are so vibrant and so fantastic. I've deliberately not worn them because I wanted to show them to you unworn. But these are obviously my uh, STU pattern. This was a standard, for me, standard 72 stitch sock. And, uh, where are we? 72 stitch sock with no um, additional Amendments, yay! <laughs> the, the heels almost match. Look, I didn't do too badly on the uh, on the colour matching there. I started them off exactly the same way as you can see there, and the heels aren't bad. And then drifted off a little bit towards the top, so they finish uh, with with different colours around the edges. But I think that's not bad at all. Oh, they feel fabulous. There's alpaca, obviously Misty Alpaca, alpaca and a little bit of silk and cashmere and a bit of nylon going on in, in these and oh they're just, oh they're so warm and so cosy, so lovely, I will wear them all day, every day, I'll never take them off. <laughs> Very happy with those, um, they're a lovely addition to my sock drawer, my ever growing sock drawer. Um, other FOs, this one's this one's been, I actually finished knitting it a long, long time ago. It's the, do you remember the Geology Shawl by Very Busy Monkey? I finally, and here we have the reason for this episode being called Block Party. I had a bit of a blocking party. While I got the mats down, I thought, well, I'll, I actually blocked the purple cowl, the stranded cowl that I've been doing. I'll show that in a minute. Um, but I also thought, well, I'll, while I've got all the equipment out, I may as well block the Geology Shawl. So let me just find the right way to show you. Here we are. So it's, I don't know how this is going to show on camera. It's very, very lacy. <laughs> I actually haven't trimmed the ends off yet. Um, but here it is. It's a very, very pretty shawl. I'll try and get it at an angle so you can see all the textures. There you go. Isn't that nice? And it has come out a lot larger than I expected it to. Uh, I, a expletive coming up. I blocked the shit out of it. I <laughs> I really did, um, because it was tiny. It was really, really tiny when it came off the needles, and I really put a lot of pressure on it. So it's not for me. Uh, I'm not a. I'm not this kind of shawl wearer. Although there's no real reason why I couldn't. I could quite happily, I suppose, wear it as a as a, a wrap type thing. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure this is the kind of stuff that. <laughs> there's the other tail. <laughs> that's where I started. Um, I'm not sure that's for me. It'll probably be a gift. Um, but it's made from pure alpaca. I can't remember the name of the yarn, something I had in stash, had it for ages. Um, and it's supposed to be uh, like scalloped edges. Hi, can you see me? It's supposed to be, oh, that's quite scary, isn't it? It's like something about Harry Potter. 
<laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's supposed to be scarlet edges, but I just I didn't have the wherewithal, or the right amount of pins, or the right equipment, or the patience really to to block uh, perfect circles. Um, so I just took each one out to a point, which I know a lot of people do with this shawl anyway. Um, but the the different sections of it are really nice. The different strata, which is why it's got a bit of lace there. It's got a bit of texture work. It's got a bit of um, star stitch. Can you see here? This is very very pretty very pretty texture and then the sort of lace scalloped edge it's just it's really nice um, so I'm very pleased with that I was I was a little bit um, nonplussed actually by the time I when I when I finished this here I was like I don't really know what to do with that but now now I've seen it in all its glory it's, it's really rather nice <laughs> does it go with the beard I think it probably does doesn't it I think that's lovely. Maybe I should wear it like that all the time. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I could I could happily wear something like this. I, I'm not sure I'd go for something with the, the the pointed edges, but I maybe I should. Maybe I should start wearing this kind of thing when I when the weather gets a little bit cooler. So uh, there we are. That's my geology shawl by Very Busy Monkey. It's a really easy knit. This is one skein. This is one 400 meter skein of. Uh, of fingering weight yarn and so it really does go quite a long way much much further than I anticipated it would before I blocked the heat out of it. Apologies for the language, my podcast, my rules. Look, if I if I hold it like this and go wee <laughs> Yeah, very happy with that. I don't know who it'll who it'll go to yet, but uh, I'm hoping it'll be somebody who will really enjoy wearing a little lacy shawl. First thing, I've, first time I've ever knitted anything like that, so I was very pleased with that. It's very easy. It looks quite complicated. It's actually a very easy pattern to to knit, and I've really enjoyed doing it. The main reason I got the blocking stuff out was because of the the cowl. The this is the cowl that uh, the stranded cowl that I've been making as a. This is the year I want to make my stranded um, tank top. I've got the pattern and I've got all the stuff ready for it. It's not my own pattern. It's called Nahini River. Nahani River. Nahani River um, and I'm really looking forward to it but I wanted to get my stranded technique better and I've re I'm really very very happy with this uh, so this is knitted with um, it's not the smoke base the big boy base from Easy Knitter uh, Easy Knits John Dunballam and it was curling like a bugger and I was really really worried about it but having blocked it really really quite vigorously it still flares a little bit at the ribbed edges, but I don't mind that too much. And here it is. So this is, uh, the purple is, um, I can't remember what the colourway is called. Ooh, John, tell me, quick. Anyway, it's, it's on the, it's, it's just, it's really, really lovely fabric. And the, it's a, it was a, a big boy gradient stack. So there's actually five colours of grey there, from the darkest into the lightest and then back out again. And then at the edges, I've used all five of those, one per row in the corrugated rib, flanked by this very, very lovely Vickle braid. It's time consuming! Now, I don't know, I don't know whether there's any point writing this up as a pattern. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely cowl. If you're, if you're interested and want to see the inside of my Stranded work, there it is. It's quite tidy really, I'm not, not too upset about that. It's alright that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really lovely. Um, and I, I'm very, you know, I'd, I'd happily wear it. And I think you can sort of twist it around and double it over into a rather wearable, warm, Cowl, I, I quite like that, um, and I will happily wear it in the come the winter. I probably wear it just like that. Um, I'm I'm not sure if it's something that anyone would want to make. What do you think? Is it worth is it worth releasing this as a pattern? Um, is basically what I'm trying to say. Uh, I've got all the notes. It wouldn't take too long to to write it up, take some nice photographs, and and release it as a as a little pattern there for anyone who wants to do it. I wasn't really planning to. Gosh, it's warm! Woohoo! <laughs> it's blue face Leicester and alpaca, I believe, in the base. But yeah, the, the, I was impressed actually how 
how much the blocking has stopped it from curling. I think it, it may want to curl a little bit in the end, but it was, I mean, it was rolling. It wasn't curling, it was rolling up. Um, and I think, I think if you just wanted to sort of wear it like that, works quite nicely, really. Hmm, it's nice. I'm happy with her, uh, with Stranded. I didn't think I'd take to Stranded work very much, but I, I've really enjoyed working on this. I'd say it's nice to be back to double knitting, but I, I've really enjoyed that. So there we are, all finished and all done. Block party completed. So, oh, do you know, there's some more stash enhancement that I completely, <laughs> it's buried here. It only arrived in the post today. Again, it's Easy Knits, John Dunballam. I saw he Instagram. this is the joy of Instagram. I was scrolling through and he Instagrammed these uh, little sets of minions, he calls them, which is very clever, minions, mini-uns. Because um, obviously everyone loves the minions from Despicable Me. This is a big boy base and it's 20% alpaca, 10% nylon, 70% Exmoor blue face. That's what that is. Um, and I, th I don't know if he was planning to do these anyway or if this was uh, sort of a knee-jerk response to the tragic events in Orlando at the Pulse nightclub. But uh, I, I saw these and I thought, I need to get these. So these are mini sets. They're six times 10 grams. So there's only there's 60, 60 grams in each. And the colorway is called Proud. I love them. I, I knew as soon as I saw them on his Instagram feed, I, was, I went straight to his shop. I thought I have to buy those. I love the way he's presented them as well. These minis are all like just sort of threaded through each other. I don't quite know how he's done it. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to get them apart. But they I've wanted for quite some time. I've wanted to get. It's got a V in it. I've wanted to get uh, some yarns properly in the colours of the rainbow flag. And it's, it's hard to find ones that all go together from this in the same set. But here they are could not be more perfect. And for anyone who wants to make anything in the rainbow flag for pride or for equality, um, it's six colors, not seven. Red, orange, green, blue, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. Those are the six colors of the pride equality flag. And this colorway is called Proud. I just, I love it. It makes me so happy. And this is going to be socks. I'm going to, because there's only 60 grams uh, per, per set, I'm going to make um, one pair, one, one sock out of each one. So there's plenty um, here. And I'm going to, uh, yeah, it's just be plenty. I might actually use, do, use black yarn for heels, toes and cuffs and then stripe I'm going to have my pride socks. I'm, going to, I'm so excited about these. I'm so excited. I'm always surprised that once it's been through a commercial process and then through John's dyeing process, and I know some of the colours, to get the colours so bright, he's used quite um, harsh chemicals. These, he still smells very sheepy. Mm, I'm a very proud gay man right now. <laughs> so there we are. Thank you, John, for those. I can't wait to start those as well. So now we are into uh, whips. We are into whips, yes. So, I'm all over the place today. This is my, uh, from Love Zena, Little Yellow Uke Crafts. Uh, so base is her Soprano sock, 75% superwash merino and 25% nylon. It's 100 grams, 425 meters, so it's quite thin, which means I'm gonna get a nice long sock. I love a long sock, I have to say, I really do. I'm not interested in these little socklet, ankly things. I'm not interested in that at all. Um, so this is how it's going. Look at that, look at the color on that. Really vibrant, really amazing, kind of almost like, almost turquoisey, oceany green, but very, very heathered, lots of sort of white streaks in it. And the sock is coming on very nicely. It's. Uh, it's an STU, of course, and it's another 72 stitch sock, well past the heel and halfway up the leg, which is so exciting, but I've used barely any of it. I've got, do you know, my scales are over there. Let's see how much I've got left. It was 100 grams. Uh, turn that on, stick the yarn on it. 
as soon as my scales wake up. Yeah, do you know what? I've got 76, 70, 75 grams left. Um, so if I want to go to 50, this is going to be halfway up my knees. Um, so I may not actually do that. I quite like it. But I've used with great uh, effect, efficacy um, the the technique for no laddering in Magic Loop that I was talking about on the last podcast. If you haven't seen that, check it out. It's the last section of the previous episode where I talk about my little um, technique that I've kind of discovered, fallen on, um, landed on for no ladders in uh, Magic Loop. I'm tired. And look, I mean, it, it's just... It would be here. This is where the ladder would be. I mean, I'm trying to display it so it looks like there might be like, there's just not. There's nothing there at all. Perhaps, if, if anything, I've gone the other way and I've gone a little bit too tight there, but it's, and on the other side as well. So if you stretch it out, there's just no, no sign at all of any laddering. It is kind of 100% ladder free. I've got a crease there because of just of where it sort of falls on the needle. But when that's on your sock, when it's sort of stretched on your foot, there's just no ladder. There's just no ladder. <laughs> it's just brilliant. I love it. So this is coming out as a very nice, lightweight sock. Lovely uh, fabric that's coming together there. Um, there's a little black smudge there. I don't know if that's me or not. I think it must have been. Um, but yeah, it's really, really nice. I'm quite enjoying the mindlessness of knitting with, with pale baby blue. Uh, so that's on its way. And uh, I've got so much else on the needles at the moment. I'm not going to show you piano number three. It's cross with me. I'm not cross with it. I love it. It's cross with me because I haven't done it. I haven't touched it since I last spoke to you. Um, I've had too many other things that I've been playing with. And of course, I've got NCOS, a bad case of NCOS, which is new cast on syndrome. When you cast on the new stuff, you want to work on that all the time. So, uh, last time I showed you the scarf that I've started making with the yarns that I bought from Wild and Woolly, which are Larissa, Travel Knitter, those four colours there. Well, I'm loving working on it. It's a bit NZ because I keep changing colours, so I've got lots of ends to sew in at the side, so forget, it's almost like a fringe. But this is how it's looking at the moment. I keep saying that. I love everything. I love my knitting. Um, but look at that. It's just glorious patterns and the colours work so well together. And what I love about this, all these patterns come from, as I said before, the Il Barato uh, book of old needlework patterns. Some people have said, well, uh, you know, can, what's the Amazon number? Can we buy it? It's, it's not a book. It's an archived. It's, it's a piece of, you know, you might find references to it in old libraries and stuff, but it's not its not a book you can buy. Um, but it's something, just look, that does not look like it came from the 16th century, that top pattern there. It just looks really modern. And that, that burgundy and, and blue there, so intricate, so delicate, and snowflakes, little sort of upside down hearty things. It's just, the problem with this scarf, ladies and gentlemen, not that it's a problem at all. The problem with it is it's utterly addictive. Now I know that knitting, particularly colour work knitting, can be a little bit, oh just one more row, just one more row. That's with something that, that repeats. Because this has no repeat, you go, oh just one more section, just one more pattern. And you just want to knit on it. I could knit on this all day and all night and never get tired. I absolutely love it. Um, <laughs> one of each colour. Um, it's just, it is mesmerising, it's wonderful to see how the patterns all uh, sort of develop underneath your needles. I am absolutely in love with this. I'm getting to a little bit of a problem, because I want the colours to come across as, as random as possible in their choices, but you can't really do that, there's only four colours. It's, it's, I'm trying not to let it fall into a set pattern of, of colour combinations. So I'm, just, I'm getting to the stage where I'm like literally picking up two at random and going, oh, I'll just use those two. So it's not, it's not random at all, because um, I am sort of judging whether I think it looks random enough. <laughs> if it really were random, it probably wouldn't always look random. 
But there it is. <gasps> gorgeous, gorgeous. Uh, oh, I can't wait to get back to knitting it. I've got an evening off tonight. I'm going to do lots of knitting this evening. I may, ooh, I'm supposed to be editing this. Ooh, maybe I won't do that tonight. Maybe I'll edit it tomorrow when I get home from work. Because I want to just, <laughs> I just want to knit. I can't wait. So this is all in uh, Travel Knitter, who is lovely Larissa, who's a good friend of mine. Uh, in English Damson, Uluru, Jaipur, and Dabbling Duck. <laughs> I love that. Um, those are the colours, and it's 75% uh, BFL superwash and 25% nylon. It's good yardage, 20, 425 metres per 100 grams, um, and it's, it's coming along so beautifully. So beautifully, I can't bear it. I can't bear it indeed. Right, there you go. Another thing from that pile to this pile. Now, let's get on to the latest, most exciting thing. This is not my pattern. This is nothing to do with anything I've done. This is from the Book of Haps. My very dear friend, I don't know if you watch actually, Tom of Holland has done something brilliant in this book. It's the Hexahap. You may have heard people talking about the Hexahap. I think it's a work of genius. I genuinely think that Tom is brilliant. Um, Tom and I have been chatting online for a couple of years, but we got the chance to meet in person finally at Edinburgh and had a lovely time, and I really, really like him. Uh, if you're watching Tom, stop listening for a bit because I'm just going to say nice things. Tom's brain appeals to me. Tom goes into the technique. He really learns everything he can, and the way he designs stuff is he, he's, he waits till he's really gets inside a technique and learns all the history, the traditions of it, exactly how everything, every minute detail of the technique works. And from that, that suggests something that he wants to design. And of all of the haps in the book of haps, I think Tom's is probably the most faithful to the original traditional ethos of what a hap is. When you start reading the book, you really understand that. I'm not su suggesting that any of these shawls shouldn't be in here. They are all beautiful. Tom's is a real hap. It's not the only one, but it's, it's of, of all of them, it's one of the ones that really sticks out as being a real hap. Um, I actually don't know how to pronounce your surname, Tom. Tom Van Dainen? 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 I think. Um, the hexa hap, as you may have gathered, is hexagonal, uh, the schematic. Um, and it's worked in a modular way. It's his. Here's the pattern. Here's the actual finished product. Look at that. It's gorgeous and it's huge as well. Absolutely huge. And this, it, the design in the middle is all done. Tom's got himself quite involved with um, Cecilia Camp Campochiaro's uh, sequence knitting technique. And it uses elements of that to create this. And I'm not going to go into the details of it, but the the stitch pattern, the texture of the middle, is as complex uh, little diamonds. You can see there, some of them are stocking stitch, some of them are reverse stocking stitch, and some of them are garter stitch. It's all done with one little sequence of, of stitches, a certain number of knits, a certain number of pearls, and for some reason, it comes out like that. My brain doesn't compute. You knit it in modular fashion. Uh, you don't. You, what you don't do, with, as you would with most um, circular things, is knit from the centre outwards and then apply the, the border. What you do is the, the border is part of each row, and it's done with intarsia. Um, but Tom, being Tom, he wanted this hat to be entirely reversible, so he's worked out a way of making the intarsia look reversible. I really wanted to cast this on, and on Saturday when I was at Loop for the class, I saw this yarn and I thought, mm, it's a bit expensive. I thought there's going to be quite a lot of it. It's a little bit too thin. I've got it. I went yesterday. And as you can see, Tom's colours here are sort of stone colour with a beautiful dark brown border. Now, you may think to yourself, <laughs> <laughs> that Nathan's not being very imaginative here and he's just f copying what's in the book. Well, that's not entirely true. Um, I have 
bought enough of the dark brown to do the dark brown border. It, it just kind of feels rustic enough. It feels like it feels like it fits. It feels right. I wouldn't want to do any bright colours with this. I wanted it to feel like it would, would not be out of place on a little Shetland cottage. But this is only the colour of the first triangle. I've decided to do all my triangles in different colours. And the yarn is, it's Barocco uh, Ultra Alpaca, which is 50% uh, superfine alpaca and 50% Peruvian wool. Now that sounds like it might be really scratchy. It's not, it's beautiful. These cakes feel, they feel so mm, dense and squishy. It's quite thick yarn. Um, it's, it's sort of worsted really. Um, what would we say here? It's 215 yards, 198 meters per 100 grams. So it's kind of a little bit thicker than a DK maybe worsted, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's so gorgeous. And these are the colors that I've bought. Each one of these colors will be a different triangle working its way, oh, so that's the dark brown for the edge, working its way around the hexagon. Let me just get them all out for you. Oh, goodness, I just love them. So, including with that, we've got this original one. Here they are. Aren't they just beautiful? For me, this is windswept moorland overlooking the beach. It's, it's Scotland. It's absolutely Shetland Isles. They're going to go so well together. All of them flanked by this fantastic dark brown. Just look at that. Now I know that Tom's original design is that the whole of the centre is done in one colour. Um, and I like that, but I think, I really do like that. It's one piece, very much one piece, but they're knitted modularly and uh, works. you work one triangle first and then you work on to the next one. Um, now interestingly, what you don't see then is how uh, the triangles kind of, when they meet together, there's a little bit of a swirl in the middle, so all the, the, the centre points kind of swirl around. And I think that's really attractive. And I think by knitting them each in a different colour, that's going to really accentuate. You'll see the vortex of swirl as the, the points of the different triangles come together. And I think it's going to look very, very attractive. These colours, I haven't yet worked out what order they're all going to go in yet, but they just... They could work in any order. They're just so gorgeous together. And do you know what? It's manly. Uh, I'm. A, don't get me wrong. I'm a man who likes colour. But I'm also a man who likes muted sophistication. And I think that's what this gives you. And I think it's going to be absolutely beautiful. So where is it? It's, it doesn't look like much at the moment. I only cast it on this afternoon. Um, Forget the green, that's that's provisional cast on. It's going to be huge. This is uh, this is from the this is the center point and this is the outside edge. And it's gonna be I mean that's half of it. So it's gonna be four times that length. It's it's too long to stretch out on this needle. Um, this is the border, so that's the border that goes all the way around the outside, and the rest of it. And this, imagine this doubled, so it's already kind of like way beyond my arm span. I think it's going to be probably about seven feet across. And oh, it's lovely. This this yarn knits up so beautifully. It's um, it feels buttery. It feels. It's the unctuousness of alpaca that I absolutely love. I've always been a fan of alpaca. I can't get enough of it. And I, it's, it's got that little sort of rustic, hard-wearing durability feel to it, which I think is, is very appropriate for the traditional aspect of the hat. I cannot wait to just wrap myself around in it. It's going to be utterly, utterly gorgeous. Only thing I'm worried about is the colour I've chosen for the waist yarn. It's so vibrant and it's a bit fluffy and it might actually rub off a bit on the edge of my shawl. Let's hope that doesn't cause any problems. Wash it or pick it off, I'm sure. But there we are. So the way you start, 
very clever. You, I started by knitting this little garter stitch using short rows of this garter stitch wedge. And then I'm now knitting. So even though this is the, this is the border, which will be sort of long, lengthwise that way, you knit it as part of the row. So I work along here, doing the bit of open work. You see the lovely open work pattern there. So you work along the rows going that way. And then you do this clever Intarsia twist that makes it irreversible. And then you pick up the new color and then you work back along the row. And then you turn it and then you repeat. You work all the way to here and then you do the Intarsia twist and then you work back along the row. So the border will grow at exactly the same rate as the rest of it. So the joy of it is, it's such a simple pattern. It's gonna be perfect TV knitting. It's a doddle, it's gonna be proper brain downtime. And yet, it's not going to be dull at all because you're, you're constantly doing the, the Intarsia twist, you're changing one colour and the, the pattern on the border is different. So it's not as if you knit the whole thing and then at the end you just do the border. You've got the, the difference of, along each row every time. Tom, it is genius. Tom, I love it. And, oh, I just... I, I don't know what to knit first, my, my scarf, my socks, my other sock, my hat, my just, back to piano number three. This is why, this is why people shouldn't have too many things on the needle. I should not have too many things on the needle because I love them and I, I want to knit them all and it means I don't want to do anything else. So normally I limit myself to about three things on the needle, sometimes a fourth, but usually just three things on the needles at any one time. Um, a sock, a piece of double knitting and something else. And this time I've got so much going on, it's slightly overwhelming. In a good way, but I really... I know I should be doing other stuff. I know I should be writing up the pattern for the spiral hat, uh, writing up the pattern for Genesis, getting on with launching um, the scarf, working on the Lorelei socks, trying to reverse engineer from that single sock that I've got that I showed last time, or the time before. I'm not going to be doing any of that. I'm just going to be knitting and knitting and knitting like a ninja, like a knitting ninja. I need to get to it. I need to get onto it. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna wrap this up. I hope you've enjoyed spending time with me this uh, this fine day. It's a lovely day actually. And a uh, slightly different angle today. You may have noticed I'm showing a little bit more of my, my shelves in the corner, just trying to get away from the window glare. Um, it's been a pleasure chatting to you. I've been really quite excited about podcasting this time because I knew I had so much to say and so much to share and so much yarny goodness to, to inspire you with hopefully um if you mm, if you don't know what to knit next if you have those same problems let me know get into uh get into the ravelry group let's chat about it let's let's find out where your knitting problems are and see if we can uh, advise and help we in the group will i'm sure everyone will have an opinion and be able to say i think you should get this one finished and then move on <laughs> and and so you can ignore our advice completely so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for spending your time with me again today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And, uh, and although this podcast episode is now a finished object, remember, life is a work in progress. Just take it one stitch at a time. Ossart. And that reminds me, Ossart being finished for you can or you know how. Um, very, very proud that... Um, my wedding film, mine and Ben's wedding, our gay wedding, the musical, was shown this week on Finnish television uh, as part of their Pride celebrations in Finland. So very, very proud of that. We had a, some nice contact with a few people. And Jutta, uh, I hope you've seen it. I know you hadn't by the time uh, when it went out, but I think you've watched it uh, soon. I hope if you haven't, I hope you enjoy it. And uh, to anyone else watching in Finland, thank you so much uh, for for. A, well, thank you very much for hosting our wedding and, and for bringing our joy and our pride in our love to, to another audience. And I, I, I think it's very important to share as much love as we can in the world at the moment. So this podcast episode very much is a finished object. But remember, life itself is a work in progress. Just take it one stitch.
see you next time. Bye-bye.